nothing but the blood of Jesus can wash you away. Amen. There are at least five passages of Scripture in the book of Mark. I'll not speak to your heart from all five passages because time would not permit us to do so. But I'd encourage you to look with me at these five passages of Scripture this morning. There's one phrase that you'll find in all five passages that I want to speak to your heart from. Look in, first of all, Mark's Gospel, chapter 3, and verse 5. And notice there the phrase, and when he had looked round about. And when he had looked round about. Then in verse 34 of that same chapter, and he looked round about on land. Go to chapter 5, if you have your Bible. And look in verse 32. This deals with the woman that had the issue of blood after she had touched Jesus. He looked round about to see her. Then if you go over to Mark's Gospel, chapter 10 and verse 23. He is dealing with salvation of souls. And Jesus looked round about and said unto his disciples. One other passage of scripture in Mark's gospel chapter 11 and verse 11. And this is a thought within itself in this verse. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked round about upon all things. I guess you've already figured the title of the message if God should let me have the privilege of titling this message. What it would be. It would be when Jesus looked round about. You say, well, that's a strange title for a message. When Jesus looked round about. Well, some of you ladies, when you feel the call of them all, the first thing you do out there is look round about. You notice everything. You notice all of the stores. All of the price tags. All of the items that are on sale as you look round about. Some of you new, uh, men, when you go to a new job, you've made application, you've been hired. Now they show you the place that you are to work. The first thing you do is look round about. You notice everything that's about you. Then when we go to the hospitals, and certainly if you've ever been into an operating room, <coughs> laying on that cold table waiting for surgery, Right before you go to sleep, you look round about. You see everything that's in that operating room. And then when you put your children in school, for the very first time in kindergarten, or you put them in first grade or second grade, or they're going into a new grade in elementary or junior high or high school, you're invited as a parent. First thing you do is look round about. When you come into church, I've noticed it among our church people, especially among the teenagers. They come into church and they'll sit down, and the next thing they do is look round about. They want to see what other teenagers are there. Some of us older folk are guilty of the same thing. We come into church and we look round about. We like to know who's sitting next to us. We like to know what's going on round about. So really and seriously, if you get down to the nitty gritty of the matter this morning, it's not a strange topic to preach on. The subject of Jesus looking round about. 
I want us to notice this morning as we bring this message, uh, the first passage of Scripture there in the Gospel of Mark, in the third chapter of Mark and in verse 5. We'll have to read uh, part of the second chapter and part of the uh, third chapter in order to get the story why Jesus looked round about. Now if you notice there in the 23rd verse through the 28th verse of Mark Gospel chapter 2, you notice that it came to pass that Jesus was going through a cornfield with his disciples and they were hungry. They hadn't had anything to eat. And so they began to pluck corn and eat of that corn. Well naturally there was always a multitude that followed our Lord everywhere he went. And they seen the Lord and his disciples plucking corn and eating on the Sabbath day begin to rebuke him for it. And in verse 24, you can see their rebuke. In verse 25, you can see the Lord's answer. He reaches way over in the Old Testament and he picks up a story there in the life of David. How that David was running from Saul. Saul had vowed that he would take David's life. And Saul, uh, David was running from Saul and he was hungry with his few men. And Jesus says David went into the house of God and there was showbread on the table. Some call it showbread, some call it showbread. On the table. And the Bible says that David did eat this showbread. Now the reason that David ate of this showbread was because David had a need. David was hungry. And the Bible says, Jesus said that David had a need. And as long as he had a, a need on the seventh day, Jesus was saying it was all right for David to eat of that bread. And then he comes down and he tells those Pharisees, he says that the seventh day was not made for man, but the seventh day man was uh, not made for the seventh day, but seventh day was made for man. And then he tells them, therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the seventh day. And now notice, the very next thing that Jesus does is to go into the synagogue. That's his next step, is to go in to the synagogue. And the Bible tells us that there was a man in the synagogue that had a withered hand. <coughs> then the Bible says those Pharisees and their followers, the Pharisees has followers. The Pharisees and their followers begin to watch the Lord Jesus Christ to see whether or not He would heal this man with a withered hand on the seventh day. <clears throat> sure enough, true to the nature of the Son of God, He tells this man with a withered hand to stand forth. That simply means that this man must have been behind the multitude or the press of the crowd. And when Jesus said stand forth, it meant that He was to step forth so that he could be observed, observed by the Pharisees and the scribes and the multitude that was there in the synagogue, so that they could, Jesus could show them what was taking place. And then the Lord said something unto the Pharisees. He said this unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day? Notice he said days. They had what we call a week of sevens. That is seven days of seventh days. And apparently the multitude had been in the synagogue for a long time. So Jesus said, is it lawful to do good on the seventh days or to do evil? To save life or to kill. Now there's two things that the Jews knew about the law. 
One, they knew to do good always. That's why the law was given, in order that man might do good. But man could never do good enough to go to heaven with the law. They knew to do good. Secondly, they knew it was wrong to do evil. They knew that. The law was given to point out to them that it is wrong to do evil. So the Bible says they kept their mouth shut. Jesus asked them a question and they could not answer this question. So they kept their mouth shut. And he answered his own question. He said to the man, stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. Now, look with me to verse 5. And when he had looked round about on them, <coughs> notice, the Bible says that he was angered with them. He looked round about upon them, and the Bible says... He was angry with them because of the hardness of their hearts. <coughs> now there was a need for David to eat of the shoe bread from the table, from the altar. There was a great need. But David's need was in no wise comparable to the need of the man with the withered hand. Jesus looked upon the multitude and he says, Now here is a man that has a need. His soul has a need. His body has a need. His spirit has a need. Or else why is he here in the synagogue? His body needed healing. His soul needed saving. His spirit needed restored. And Jesus said, here is a need. But you have become callous, hard-hearted, inconsiderate of those that are in need. He was saying, where is your where is your love? Where is your kindness? Where is your sympathy with this man? He looked upon them. The Bible says he was grieved. The word grieve simply means that he had a deep sorrow. Not for the condition of the man. Hey, Jesus could take care of that problem. Jesus could fix that problem. That wasn't no bother to the Son of God. He had the answer for that. But he looked upon the Pharisees and their followers. And he saw hard hearts. He saw no love and no compassion. And he was grieved in his heart. I wonder today. I wonder, as our Savior looks about, round about here today, in this church, in this building, I wonder if he is grieved in his heart with what he sees. The hardest thing for our Lord to fix is a hard cold, indifferent heart. He could deal with that man 
with a withered up hand, he could just speak a word and have him to stand forth and speak a word and, and he would be healed. But there was no words that Jesus could speak that would cause that hard heart of the Pharisees and scribes and multitude to melt and to flow with love and compassion. That's why he was angered. And that's why he was grieved. I believe he was angered with the devil. Hey, they were religious people. <laughs> Religion will make you hard. Religion will make you cold. Man that with a withered hand. I thought about the withered hand. I thought about the withered hand. Surely Jesus saw the man with a withered hand. And I thought about what it is. The hand that was withered. You know the word withered, divine, simply means this. It means to decay, to rot, <coughs> to become weak, to become helpless, to become useless. And I thought, as our Lord looks about today in this congregation, what is it that our Lord sees? Well, I'll tell you, first of all, he sees hard hearts. He sees men and women with hard hearts. Hey, there used to be a time I could preach and you would weep. There used to be a time I'd give an altar call and you'd hit the altar. There used to be a time that you'd say, hey, I'll go on visitation. There used to be a time that you would get down and weep and pray for the lost souls. There used to be a time you'd get behind the work, but today he sees a hard heart and he is grieved yeah, as he looks about. Yeah. <coughs> Hearts that are hardened by bitterness and disappointment in life. Hey, our hearts can get hard sometimes. My bitterness. We get bitterness toward each other. We get bitterness toward our pastor. We get bitterness toward our friends. We get bitterness in our homes. We get bitterness on our jobs. And our hearts begin to get hard. Disappointments of life comes along and they knock at our heart's door. So often we know every time they knock, we know what it's going to be. Old disappointment's going to be standing there and we get hard of heart. <coughs> hard hearts. Hearts insensitive to the need of others. It used to be a time you'd reach out to others and put your arms around them and weep with them and pray with them and help them financially or help them uh, in some way or another, you would do that. But our hearts have got insensitive. Right. Amen. They're hard. Hearts which are not kind and loving and forgiving. Hearts that want to hold grudge and hearts that want to keep evil and, and hearts that want to harbor up malice and envy and hate and jealousy toward each other. Right. Amen. He sees that. Hard hearts. And it grieves him. He sees hearts that are full of sin and hate. He sees those hearts. Hey, how do we expect anyone to get saved? How do we expect anyone to get born into the family of God? How do we expect our church to grow? How do we expect our church to flourish when we have hard hearts? And Jesus looks upon us and He is grieved in His soul. I believe as he looks about today, he sees not only hard hearts, but I believe he sees withering hands. Hands that are withered. Hands that used to be strong. Hands that used to reach out and help each other. Hands that used to build and battle in this church. Hands that used to lift up the erring one and the fallen one. I believe he sees those hands that have withered. You don't do that anymore. Right. How long has it been since you spoke to someone about their soul? How long has it been since you prayed for someone to be saved? 
How long has it been since you've forgiven someone and say, hey, I forgive you. Though you trespass against me, I forgive thee. How long has it been? Hands that reach out to these blind souls to Jesus. Hands that would join with the brethren and labor with the brethren have withered. Hey, it's almost impossible to get a crowd to come out now to view a film. It's almost impossible to get folk to uh, get together and have good Christian fellowship. It's almost impossible. I mean, we can get a few. I grant you that. We can get a few to come out. There's always the faithful few. Thank God for the faithful few. But where are all of those that used to come? I'll tell you where they are. Their hands have withered in doing the Lord's work. Amen. You need the touch of the Master. On their life. I was thinking last night. When I answered the call to preach, I asked my pastor, Pastor, what can I do? We'd go on visitation. Me and Brother Claude Campbell would go on visitation. I'd say, Preacher, if there's anything I can do, you let me do it. I mean, you let me do it, preacher. If I can visit, you let me visit. If I can teach a Sunday school class, you let me teach it. If I can usher in the church, you let me usher. If I can go on visitation with you, you let me know. If I can go to the hospital, you call on me. I'd been here last night for that funeral. But I'd call <coughs> Hey, I'm telling you the truth. I'm not lying to you. Hands that are eager to do the work of the Lord. Withered hands. Then I believe Jesus sees something else that is withered. Not only hard hearts, not only withered hands. He saw that. He saw the hard hearts among the Pharisees and scribes and their followers. He saw the withered hand with the one that was lame there. He saw the withered hand, but there's something else he saw. He saw a withering desire. Desire to be in his hand. Is with me. Brother, if I wanted excuses to stay out of God's house, I'd stay out this morning. But I woke up not looking for an excuse. I didn't wake up looking for an excuse to stay out of God's house. But I could have got me an excuse right quick to stay out this morning. And listen, it would have been legitimate as far as your excuses are concerned. Compared to yours, it would have been legitimate. <coughs> Maybe with man, but not with God. Amen. I say desires are withering. Desires to be in God's house is decaying and dying. <coughs> in our churches. Folks don't have to. And get up and go deer hunting on Sunday morning. Cut their grass on Sunday. <coughs> Mow their lawn. Build their buildings. Roof their houses. Go to work. They all plan from one Sunday to the next Sunday how they can be out on that Sunday. They've lost their desire. Used to be a time that nothing on this side of eternity would keep you out. Amen. But they're <coughs> I don't have to bring scripture up. You know I've preached enough scripture on this subject of being faithful to God's house you ought to know all about. Amen. Lost the desire to be blessed. Yes. Come out to God's house say, you bless me if you can. But with that kind of attitude, there's nobody to bless you. God himself can't bless you. God. Amen. Amen. If I died according to some of you's looks, I'd done been dead 100,000 times. <laughs> you made your mind up you're not going to be blessed. 
You've already stated that in your mind before you ever come to church. I am not going to be blessed today. I'm going to be a sour puss and let everybody know it. When you come into church, they can see it. I've got a terrible headache. I think the ladies for the field probably go, but I bust a gut before I not smile and rejoice in my Lord before you this morning. Amen. 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 I mean that thing. I've been preaching a lot longer than you have. And let me say something, honey. I told a preacher the other night, I said, let me tell you something. He's talking about preachers and losing their churches and young preachers coming along and both of them. I said, let me tell you something. I said, preaching is my passion. I love preaching. I love to preach the Word of God. And there's no young squirt going to jump up after I've been in church for 28, 29 years or 30 years preaching the gospel and passion in one church for 27 years. There's no young squirt going to jump up and try to put me out of my church when it's not only my passion, but it's my livelihood. He'll have a fight on his head. Amen. I said, now, if God moves me, that's different. Amen. I'll go. <laughs> but if God don't move me, I'll stay there, and that man will have a fight on his hand. One of us will go pretty quick. Amen. That's good. He's talking about withering desire. Desire to be in God's house is withering. Desire to pray and worship is withering. People don't want to pray no more. They don't want to worship no more. Desire for fellowship with the brethren is withered. I've got to hurry. I've got three more points. I'm not going to take all five of them. I wish that I could. What would Jesus see if he looked around this morning? As he looks about, I may say, as he looks about, does he see a hard heart? Does he see hands that are withered? Does he see a desire that's withering? This morning as he looks around. You see, Jesus was grieved as he looks about. I don't grieve my Savior today with a hard heart. I don't want to grieve my Savior today with a withering hand. I don't want to grieve my Savior today with a withering desire. When he looks upon my heart, I want him to find there that eagerness to be the Christian he would have me to be. How about you? Yes. There's a second passage of Scripture found in that same chapter in verse 35. You'll have to read these few verses to get the thought of it. He says in verse 31, There came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without, sent unto him, calling him, and the multitude said about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brother without seeketh for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother? are my brethren. And he looked round about on them which sat about him and said, Behold my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of God is the same as my brother and my sister and my mother. When I see him looking about this morning, I see him as a divine kinsman. Thank God there are not all of us have withering hands. Not all of us have hard hearts. Not all of us have faulting desire. But thank God there are a few that still seek to do the will of God. Amen. And will do the will of God until God comes. Yes. There was a multitude, and the multitude had gathered, and some of them whispered to Jesus and said, Your mother and your brethren are on the outside seeking thee and calling for thee. And Jesus said, Who is my mother and my brother? Then he answered that question, did he not? Those that do the will of God are my brother, sister, and mother. Those are my kinsmen. Those that do the will of God. And I thought about my near kinsman, Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Thank God when he died yonder on Calvary's cross, he died to save souls and make disciples and kinsmen. Amen. 
on the will of the Father. <coughs> you are His kinsman. Right. He is our kinsman. Amen. My big brother will fix it too. How about yours? As He looked upon them, He had that look. Well, you're my kinsman. I'm your kinsman. Hey, isn't that great to know that you belong to Him this morning? You know how I know I belong to Him? Not only because of redemption, not only because of my salvation and separation, but because of what I've endured. I know I belong to Him. There's not a fool this side of heaven that would endure what I've endured apart from salvation and still be here. Even Carl Woodbury couldn't stand it over nine years. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying, bless God, I come back time after time after time, not for you, not for the church, not for the crowds, but for my kinsman, Jesus. Amen. That's why he says we're not be weary and well doing. I could have quit 100,000 times. Nobody's ever run me off. Nobody will ever run me off. When Jesus gets ready for me, I'll leave. There's no ball team will run me off. There's no church will run me off. There's no deacon board will run me off. You say, well, what are you, a dictator? Call it anything you want. I'm here to God gets through with me. Amen. When God gets through with me, hey, I told my wife this not one time but a thousand times. I said, when God tells me it's time to go, I'll go without shedding a tear. That's right. You know why I keep coming back? You know why you keep coming back? You know why you keep pouring on? You know why you keep enduring and persevering? It's because of your divine kinsman. He looks upon this crowd today as he looks about and he says, that one's mine. And that
Let's take Mark chapter 11. I think this is good. Hey, I'm going to start you with something. God gave me this message and showed me these five thoughts from reading the Bible. And he showed me something else in this passage. Scripture. You may not see the thing in it. But I'm going to start with you with something this morning. Now, I want you to listen carefully. Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 11. Jesus entered into Jerusalem. That's the city of God. And into the temple, Herod's temple. When he had looked around about, notice this, upon all the things. Hey, the first thing Jesus did was look at the beauty, the magnitude, and the magnificence of the original. It was built according to the tabernacle, the plan of the tabernacle. They had an outer court, and I believe my Savior walked the outer courts <clears throat> and looked upon all things. They had a woman's court, and I believe my Savior walked in the women's court, and he looked upon all things. They had built the temple itself, and I believe my Lord walked into the temple itself, and right there in the holy place, he looked upon all things in the holy place. Then I believe he went into the holy of holies. While my Savior was there, he looked about upon all things in the holy of holies. But you know what? He looked at God's house, but he did not see his Father. God's house, but his Father. And there was a time when God dwelt there in the temple. There was a time when he could have fellowship with his father in the temple. But the Bible says he looked about upon all things. Beautiful, magnificent, yet his father wasn't there. Doesn't this describe our churches today? Beautiful churches. Steeples that pierce the blue of the heaven. Some of the most beautiful windows and uh, furnishings that our churches have ever known we're enjoying today. I wonder if the fathers. He not only looked upon the temple, but he looked upon the priest. Oh, they were noted for their finery in dress, for their uh, borders of their garment and the veils and the design and the breastplate and all that they were. Hey, it's wonderful just to read of the dress of the priest. He looked upon the priest and he saw outwardly all of the beauty but inwardly, he saw that they did not have his father. <coughs> hey, I'm not going to stop there. The Bible says as he looked about upon all things, he saw the people. He saw them come in. And he saw them go out. Just as they came in. It died. Without anything. I've heard people say I went to church today and didn't get a thing. <coughs> That's true in my church. He not only saw people come in and out, but he saw the money changers there. He saw the sellers of doves turn up. Catch the people coming into the temple to offer a sacrifice and they would change their money and sell them doves. He saw all of this. 
And she looked about and put all things in his father's house in the temple. <coughs> he said, why? This is not even a decent place to pray. Look at your Bible. This is not even a decent place to pray. My father's gone. They've made my father's house a den of thieves. No one's being blessed. This is not even a decent place to pray. The Bible says he went out and he went to bed. What was bed? Tell me, what was bed? He took his disciples with him. What was Bethany? Bethany was a place of prayer where Jesus always resorted. It was a place where he could go, get down, and know there that he could get in touch with God. How wonderful. As he looks around upon us today, Upon our hearts, upon our work, upon our church. I wonder if he's saying the same thing. Is that a place of prayer? Is that a place of thanksgiving? Is that a place of praise? Is that a place of rejoicing? Is that a place where my father dwells? desire for you to be in your Sunday school class at the appointed hour. There ought to be a burning desire for you to get behind your pastor and get behind the work and back him up and quit being so indifferent and cold and, and insensitive to the need of God's people and God's house and God's land. Yeah. You ain't going to get no other preacher coming here to preach to you. 
preach to you like that because I'm looking. How many have I heard say, I want to do something for the Lord and it died out before the next day? The flame of desire was watered out before you ever got it burned for Jesus. I heard some of you say, we're going to sing for Jesus and to God's glory. How much of you sung lately? Now, I agree with you. We don't need everybody in the church to come up here and sing. Because some of you can't sing at all. I'm going to be frank with you. <coughs> some of you can't sing at all. How long has it been since you said, hey, I'm going to get behind my church with my support? Back my church up with my support. How long has it been since you said that? And then put it into action. How long has it been since you said, preacher, I'm going to go to this session, I'm going to be a witness for the Lord. I may not be able to come on Monday night or Tuesday night or Thursday night or visitation night, but preacher, I'm going to set a time apart in my life where I'll witness for Jesus. And I'm going to do it. Remember, he looks about upon what did that little word say? A double A. All all things. And I'll tell you what. <coughs> if you can find scripture on what I'm about to say, you could review that. <coughs> But I don't believe Jesus has missed one birthday. I don't believe there's one heart that goes unnoticed. I don't believe there's one thought that's went through your mind that he hasn't on a, put down already on pages of a record book. He doesn't miss a thing. I miss a lot of things. I can't hear too well at times. Especially in the crowd when everybody's talking or out of the fellowship hall and all that kids are running around all that noise. I, I can't distinguish one on one what they're saying unless I get real quiet. I miss a lot. Jesus doesn't miss a thing. Sometimes I, I don't see everything because I don't have eyes in the back of my head. But listen, young people, he can see every time you're not interested in the message. He can see every time you're not burdened about the work. He can see every time you're not concerned about doing something for His glory. He can see that. <coughs> you say, preacher, you, you got a burden heart. You just don't know how burdened my heart is. You really don't. You really don't know the burden that you put on. Oh, I'm not one of these preachers that can reach up and turn tears on them like a faucet <coughs> causing the flow. I don't do these. It takes a lot to make me weep. I've cried 10,000 tears in my lifetime. And I've cried that I couldn't cry. Be dry. Tear ducts just quit pollution. It's not easy for me to cry. But I'm weeping in my soul. <coughs> I want to say this this way for my church. My Probably some of you said, well, the preacher don't seem to be in sin. <coughs> he just don't seem to be in sin. Have you ever thought there may be a good reason? The burden. I don't bear a burden. I'm concerned about other churches. But I don't have a burden for other churches like I have a burden for our church. I don't have a burden for other church people like I do for my people. My burden is so tremendous. that it robs me of my joy What can I say? All I can say is that 
kingdom of God. All I can say is that <coughs> he's looking about upon all me. All I can say is one day he's going to say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of my rest. Prepared for you from the foundation. <coughs> you were faithful over little. Now I'm going to give you a whole lot. Here we go. Hey, folks. Not much of a title, is it? Thank you.